After this, it says in verse 5, uh, sorry, verse 1, after this, after what? The end of chapter 4 of John tells us about Jesus healing somebody from a distance. There was a man who came to Jesus, a man of very important authority. He came to Jesus uh, in Cana, of Galilee. And this man was a noble man, and his son was sick in another city, Capernaum, which is quite a little way away from Cana. And so he heard that Jesus was coming, and he went to Jesus and implored him to come down to Capernaum and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. And Jesus just simply said to him, go your way, your son lives. And so he believed the word that Jesus said to him, and he meant his way, and then when he got near to his home, his servants met him, and he told them, your son lives. <laughs> Hallelujah. Jesus wasn't there in the house in Capernaum. Jesus was in another place. He was in another village, another city called Cana. But he spoke the word, and he was healed. Maybe some of you here today are distressed because somebody you love in your home, in your family, somebody that you cannot see face to face at this time is not well. You know, your prayers in the name of Jesus do count. Your prayers can make a miracle happen. And I want to encourage you, if you have that kind of situation, rather than just feeling sad and hopeless because you're away from home, to actually pray in the name of Jesus. Because God can do miracles from a distance. Hallelujah. It's not just here, but there are other cases too. And you remember when Jesus met the lepers, and those lepers were uh, out in the mountains because they can't go into the city. So they were walking on the mountain road, the desert road. And... Uh, they were a long distance from Jesus. Uh, he was not near them. And they cried out to Jesus, Jesus, please heal us. Jesus, please heal us. And so from a distance, he cried back, be healed. <laughs> and they were all healed. <laughs> Hallelujah. Sometimes we think, oh, we have to lay hands on people to heal them. Or we have to be close to people to heal them. Jesus didn't. He knew exactly the situation and he was able to pray for people or to speak the word and they would be healed even at a distance. So I want to encourage you to pray if there's situations in your home, in your family where people need the Lord. Pray for them. Pray for them. In your private prayers, pray for them. In your devotions, pray for them. Because God can touch their lives even when you are not there. Jesus is there. Amen. So it was after that that Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And here in Jerusalem, there was rather an amazing thing happening. An amazing phenomenon, if you like. The Pool of Bethesda, where a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, and paralyzed, were waiting for the moving of the water. And when the angel came and went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water, whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water, was made well of whatever disease he had. Now when I read this, it really makes me think. Sometimes, we as believers, lack vision because we are so self-centered. Our Christian life is just about me and God, me and God, me and God. In the days of the Bible, when Jesus called people, save people, transform their lives. It was not just about me and God, but it was about God and me and somebody else. Sometimes we just think about our needs, our problems, our sicknesses, our struggles. We don't think of anybody else. We are like this multitude, you know, almost competing to get into the pool and ignoring everybody else. And I believe God wants to continue to release his love and compassion in your church and in this chapel and amongst international st students and faculty in Handong University. God wants to release his compassion. Amen. So that our prayers for others, our, our concerns for others can be very real things. It's just not just me and God, but it's me and God and other people. Hallelujah. 
That we're not just putting our eyes on the pool, but we're putting our eyes on Jesus, who's the author and finisher of our faith, and we're following what he wants us to do. That's really, really important. Because if we only live for ourselves, if we only focus on ourselves and our needs and our sicknesses and our headaches, our frustrations, actually we become very spiritually burdened and dry. God wants us to focus on Him and let Him lead us and let Him uh, work through us to encourage those people around us. That's so important. So important. Let's not be like the multitude gathered at the pool waiting for the water to move and jumping in first. But let us be people who help others to enjoy the water too. <laughs> because there are people who need Jesus in Handong University. Just the fact that it's called God's University and the fact it's a Christian university doesn't mean that everybody's 100% okay. There are people who need Jesus. There are people who need the love of God, the truth of God, the spirit of God, the fellowship, prayer, not just ourselves. So we should also be thinking of others. I think that's a very important part of life in this place. Let's move on. So it says, there was a certain man there who was, had an infirmity or paralysis for 38 years. Most people here, some of us are over 38, but most people here are not 38 years old. We don't know how old he was, but he was paralyzed for 38 years. So whenever the crowds went down to the water to get in the water to be, try to be healed, try to be the one to get healed when the angel touches the water, he was just ignored. He was just left. Maybe he tried to get to the water but he couldn't get there he couldn't get there there was no hope for him being healed by that water that was stirred by the angels he was in that condition for 38 years and Jesus says in verse 6 Jesus saw him lying there and he knew that he already had been in that condition a long time he knew. Jesus knew. Jesus doesn't have to ask questions. He wasn't asking around the crowd, hey, how long has that guy been like that? Jesus wasn't doing that. He knew that man had been like that for 38 years. Jesus knows exactly our situation today. The Bible tells us Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's omnipotent, he's omniscient. He knows all things. Hallelujah. He knew about the condition of that man. He knows about our condition today. It's possible for us to live a lie before other people. It's possible for us to live in shame before other people. It's possible for us to live in fear before other people, not wanting to share about our life problem with them. And we think nobody knows. But Jesus knows. Jesus knows all about us. All about our lives. All about our families. All about our situation and status in life now. He knows about our spirituality or lack of it. He knows us very well. And he loves us. Hallelujah. John 3.16 does not say, for God so loved Christians. It says, for God so loved the world. Whatever background we may come from whatever the religion of our family may be, I want to say today that God loves us and he wants us all to be saved. Hallelujah. Whoever we are in this place, you haven't got to say the word Christian before God loves you. God loves you right now for who you are and he wants you to experience Jesus as your Lord and Savior, the forgiveness of your sins and new life. He knows all about us. 
He knows our weaknesses. He knows our failures. He knows our successes. He knows our talents. He's given us our gifts. He knows all about us. We have no secrets with Jesus. No secrets with God. Jesus knew he'd been in that condition a long time. And he asked him a very simple question. He said, do you want to be made well? What a very simple question. But the man didn't really understand what Jesus was trying to get at. What Jesus was trying to say to him. He didn't understand the word of the Lord. So instead of just saying yes, he said, Sir, I've got nobody to put me into the pool where the water is stirred up, but while I'm coming, another steps down before me. How miserable it must have been for him for all those years just to be lying there and just everybody passes by, walking over him, walk past him, just passing by, getting down into that water and being healed. How miserable it must have been for him. So his only hope was getting into that water, but it was impossible. Because nobody would help him, because everybody else was trying to get healed themselves. Tragic situation. Tragic life. Jesus said to him, do you want to be made well? So when that man said that nobody could help him, nobody could take him down into the water, nobody wanted to help him, Jesus simply said to him, rise, take up your bed and walk. Hallelujah. Amazing. Rise, take up your bed, walk. He didn't even put his hand on him and pray for him. He just said, come on, get up. Take up your bed. It's time to walk. And it says, immediately the man was made well. He took up his bed and he walked. Hallelujah. What a wonderful miracle. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I want to talk for a moment. I won't keep you long. I want to talk for a moment about paralysis. Are you paralyzed? I don't think there's anybody here that's physically paralyzed. Maybe there's somebody in university, I don't know. But you know, we can be paralyzed in other ways too. We can be paralyzed emotionally. We can go through traumatic experiences in our family life. Things that really have been painful for us. Things that we had no control over. Parents' divorce. Domestic violence. Things that wound us emotionally, paralyze us emotionally. So we don't grow. We don't get healed. Even we may have an adult body in our emotions. We still act like a little child. And we get into all kinds of problems because of that. All kinds of difficulties. Maybe we've been through broken relationships. Somebody we trusted, somebody we thought we loved or we thought loved us. We had some kind of special relationship. And it broke up. And we were left with paralyzed emotions. We still live in the dreams of the past on what happened and what hasn't happened. We live a paralyzed life. I believe that Jesus wants to heal us. That Jesus wants to speak his word into our lives and bring us back to life again so that we can be healthy in our emotions because our, our emotions are so important. Tells us in the book of Proverbs to guard our heart with all diligence because out of our heart come all the issues of life. Our heart condition, our emotions, so important. 
They affect the way we think, the way we respond, the way we talk, what we believe. So much comes out of our heart. And today, if you're one of those people who has these kind of uh, paralyzed emotions, I believe Jesus wants to touch you today and to say to you, rise up and walk. He asks you the question, do you want to be made well? Do you want to get free from it? Maybe there are some of you here who have a paralyzed will. You're so passive. You're always dependent on somebody else to make decisions for you. Maybe all your life, other people have made decisions for you. Maybe even to come to Handong University, somebody made a decision for you. So all your life, people have made decisions for you. You look to people to make decisions for you. You can't make any decision by yourself. Because you become dependent on others. Because when you were younger, others told you exactly what to do all the time. You had no freedom to make your own decisions and your own choices when the time came for you to do that. So even now, even here, you want somebody to tell you what to do. You want somebody to make a decision for you. And then if they make a wrong decision, you can be angry at them. You can blame them. <laughs> Paralyzed will. Paralyzed will. If we're like that, we cannot do what is right. We want to do what is right, but we cannot do what is right because our will is paralyzed. So we, we always just go with the flow. Whatever's going on, we just go with the flow. Even though maybe we know the flow is wrong, we just go with it. Then we get messed up. God wants to heal and restore a paralyzed will. Maybe some of us here are paralyzed spiritually. You've never grown as a Christian. That was the problem in the Hebrew church. We read about it in, in uh, Hebrews chapter 5. I'm not going into that today. But that was the main problem in the church. The Hebrew church, they were not growing. They were still like babes. They should be able to serve others. They should be able to, to apply the word of God to their life. They should be able to discern. But they couldn't do it. And he wasn't just talking to young people. He was talking or writing to young people. He was writing to the whole church. The fathers as well. The mothers as well. Spiritually they were paralyzed. They were so passive. They weren't growing spiritually. You know... I believe this place has a gift. And one of the gifts of Handong University is to help people grow spiritually whilst they're studying. Amen. That you can come to church and grow. Come and find Jesus Christ. Come to church and grow. And your life can change as a new creation. You know, it's not a matter of becoming a Christian and that's it. That's not what faith is all about. That's not what the Christian life is all about. There's much more to it than that. I'm going to turn briefly to uh, 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Starting at verse 17. Now the Lord is the Spirit... And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. There's liberty. Amen. So if we are being filled with the Holy Spirit, if we are encountering the Holy Spirit, and we are being filled with the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit of God is working in our life, we will live in freedom. If our family is filled with the Holy Spirit, then our family will live in freedom. If our church is filled with the Holy Spirit, our church will, will live in freedom, will serve in freedom. It will be such a joy to be in our church. If the university is filled with the Holy Spirit, then wow, we'll be living in freedom. People will come here and find Jesus and their lives will be changed. 
Wherever the Holy Spirit is, there's freedom. There's no bondage in the Holy Spirit. There's no weird things with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit brings freedom wherever he is. And then he says in verse 14, but we all, we all, A-L-L, all. Some of you say, all, all. <laughs> with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. In other words, we are being changed. We are being transformed. That's how it should be. That's how our life should be. We are being changed. We are being transformed. We should be different this semester to last semester in a positive way. We should be. We should be growing in Jesus. We should have more faith. We should be having a cleaner, clearer life and a vision for our future. That's how it's meant to be if we are a believer in Jesus. That's how it's meant to be. We should be changing from glory to glory. <laughs> we should be in a better condition spiritually now than we were a, a semester ago or a year ago. That's God's will. That's God's plan. That's how it is to be a believer in Jesus. That's how it's meant to be here. That we're changing from glory to glory. We're growing in faith. Hallelujah. That's what it's meant to be. But some people are spiritually paralyzed. They can't move. They just lie on the mat looking at everybody else. There's no change in their life. No vision for their future. No clear way ahead. You know, if we have a vision for our future, we have an anticipation that Jesus is going to lead us into something good. Right? If we have no vision for the future, we do not have that anticipation. I want to turn to another scripture from 1 John. I didn't plan to do this, but I, I feel I should. 1 John. Chapter 3. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called children of God. Father God loves us. Therefore the world does not know us, meaning the people in the world, the world system, does not know us because it did not know him. Verse 2, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we will see him as he is. That means Jesus Christ. We have an anticipation. One day we are going to see Jesus. One day we're going to see him face to face. All of us are going to see him. One day we'll meet with Jesus. And if we have this hope, if we have this joy that our life on this earth, when we finish our life on this earth, we are going to meet with Jesus face to face. It says there, if we have this hope, verse 3, we purify ourselves just as he is pure. We have a spiritual dimension in our life. I want to be pure. I want to glorify God. I want to fulfill the vision that God has for me whilst I'm upon this earth. That God has some kind of priority in our life. Following Jesus has a priority in our life. That's what it should be if we are believers in Jesus. If we don't have that hope, then it's very difficult to keep ourselves pure. very difficult. It's very easy to fall down. It's very easy to get into sin and shame and bondage. And if we live like that, then everything suffers in our life. Our studies suffer. Our spiritual life suffers. Our emotional health suffers. 
So many things suffer if we get our lives messed up because we have no vision. No hope. We could be 21 years old, 24 years old, 26 years old and have no hope. It's not only those tramps who live on uh, Seoul Station, Seoul Yok. It's not only those people who have no hope. Maybe even some people in Handong University have no hope. No hope. No vision. And if we live like that, it's so difficult to live a life that's glorifying to God. It's so difficult to keep ourselves pure. Because all our priorities are muddled up and mixed up. We cannot concentrate very well. We're emotionally all over the place. Up and down, up and down. Spiritually, we're paralyzed. So alongside physical paralysis, there's emotional paralysis. There's paralysis of the will. And there's spiritual paralysis. Now the compassion of Jesus Christ was always active. One of the definitions I like of the word compassion is love in action. <laughs> Jesus was compassionate. He didn't just look and say, oh so sad, so sad. He had compassion. He did something about it. He changed people's lives. He gave freedom to people. He healed their disease. He forgave their sin. He told them he knew all about their life. And their life was changed as he met them. Just like he met the, the woman at the well in the previous chapter. John chapter 4 at the beginning. They encountered Jesus. And when they encountered Jesus, he, they encountered his compassion, his grace, the love of God, and their lives are changed. Jesus Christ is the same, the Bible says, yesterday, today, and forever. We're not following something we have to attain to. We're following someone who loves us and wants to help us to live in a victorious life. We're not following something to attain to because we can't in our own effort. We're following somebody who loves us and cares about our lives. And I believe that God wants to minister to some people here today by his Holy Spirit. I believe the same words that Jesus spoke to that man who was lying there, who couldn't get into the water, and he was been sick for 38 years. The same words, he says, do you want to be well? Do you want to be well? Do you want to be well? Do you want to experience restoration and healing for paralysis in your emotions, will? Spiritual life? Do you want to? Whatever your situation today, it doesn't matter what your situation is, whatever your situation is today, Jesus is able to bring transformation to your life. Hallelujah. He wanted to. The man wanted to. Yes, he really wanted to because he said, nobody can put me in the pool. He wanted to. But he didn't understand and didn't realize what Jesus was going to do. And Jesus just said to him, rise, take up your bed and walk. And that was it. He was, he was, he was different. He didn't have to go to occupational therapy or physiotherapy. He didn't have to go to a rehab hospital. Now thank God for occupational therapists and rehab hospitals and physio. Thank God for them. But he didn't have to go. Because Jesus spoke the word to him. And it says he is immediately made well. He took up his bed and he walked. Do you want to be made well? Let's pray.